Um, so we are in our second week of our series, Big Butts, and, uh, <laughs> and we are looking, we're spending the next five or so weeks looking at Moses' five butts that he had when God was revealing to him his, his calling and his purpose. And so um, we are in our second week right now, so we are looking at Moses' second butt. There we go. Who said that? Awesome. There it is. So uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 today. Um, and it says this, But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? And then verse 14, I, I'm not sure if it's on your notes or not. But God replied to Moses. Aren't you glad that God replies? That when you, when you ask a question that he'll, he'll answer you if you listen. He, uh, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Whew. Come on, that's some swagger right there. I am who I am. God, what's your name? I am who I am. My goodness. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This morning, uh, I want to talk to you from the subject, simple subject, I am. I am. I know I just prayed, but it's kind of a habit, so I'm going to pray one more time. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for what you're doing already this morning. God, I really believe that uh, worship softens our heart to, to, uh, to make good ground for what you're wanting to do. And so, God, right now I pray that uh, the seed that comes forth from your word, that it would produce good ground. God, that we don't want to leave the same way that we came in, not for our benefit, but so that we can leave here and change our world, change our community, change our workplace, change our family. God, we love you. We honor you this morning. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't like bills. I'm probably sure, like, I'm not the only person that feels this way. I especially don't like phone bills or cable bills. Because it seems like phone bills and or cable, hopefully no one works at a phone or cable company. But it always seems like they always try to throw extra things in the bill that you have no idea what it's from. And they don't tell you, they just kind of charge you. You with me? And, and so um, it was about a week and a half ago, uh, we have T-Mobile, I know, I know, don't judge, but I just learned T-Mobile is like the number one cellular company in the United States, so laugh all you want, but we have T-Mobile, and, um, and where, where am I going with this? We have T-Mobile, oh, so about a week and a half ago, uh, we got a bill they send our bill on, like through a text. And so my wife gets this text, and it says, we have a bill of over $500. Whoo! Yeah, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, what is going on? And so I do what every husband would do in that moment. Babe, take care of it. And, and, so, <laughs> and so my wife, she, she calls him up, and she's, um, she kind of gets that, that whole runaround Eventually, though, they say, uh, they tell my wife, um, don't worry about it. We'll take it off. It's all good. Um, right? That's good news. Well, unfortunately, my wife forgot one important thing when it comes to talking with someone over the phone. You always got to get their, their name. And, and so um, this actually was a Monday. She got another text saying that our bill was past due again. And I was like, babe, clearly you are not taking care of this. Let me do it. And so I was like, babe, let me get the person's name that you talked to. And she's like, she's like, I, I, didn't, I didn't get a name. And I'm like, babe, really? Like you always got. And so like I'm calling and I have to start from scratch. This whole ordeal. I got to explain to them who I am, what's going on. That someone had talked to my wife, well, what was that person's name? I don't know, but it was, we talked to, and it was just this real big ordeal. Eventually, this girl that I was talking to, she was very nice and very kind. 
And she said, sir, don't worry. We'll take care of it. And I was like, awesome. But there was a little bit of doubt in the back of my head just because someone else had said that. So my first uh, response to when she said, we'll take care of it was, or my first question was, what is your name? <laughs> she said, my name is so, so I wrote down her name. And I said, well, thank you, so-and-so, and, and we hung up. So long story short, we got it taken off of our bill, that price. But, but here's, here is the, the thing that I, I made sure that I would do is that I would get the person's name just in case if poop hit the fan, right, as the saying goes, kind of, <laughs> as poop hits the fan, I had a name to fall back on to say, hey, listen, so-and-so said this. Talk it up with her. I feel like this is kind of the same thing that, that Moses is getting at in this, in this passage right here. You see, God had just revealed to Moses. He, God just told Moses, hey, Moses, this is what you're going to do. I, I'm going to call you or I've called you to set my people free. That's a big calling. And so Moses, he does what most of us would do. And, and he, he kind of falls with what most of us, we typically do. And this is our second uh, discouragement. He deals with doubt. So much so that he goes to, uh, when God says, this is what I want you to do, Moses he, he says, um, okay, what's your name, though? What's your name? See, I think this is very interesting because a few verses prior, when God first reveals himself to Moses with the fiery bush, uh, the first thing that Moses, or the first thing that God says is this. I am God, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. So God has already identified himself to Moses. Fast forward, Moses is once again saying, God, what, what, who do I tell him sent me? Isn't that interesting? It's almost as if Moses was like, God, I, I don't need to know. I know who you are, clearly. But it's for those people over there, they need to know. You all ever done that before? <laughs> it's not me, it's them, but you might as well tell me too, right? Like, it's, I feel like this is what's going on with, with Moses. He, 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 he heard what God's, who God, I uh, got, God, God, <laughs> God, let's cut that out from the, from the audio. God identified himself already. And yet Moses once again is saying, God, not for me, but for the people that I'm going to send. Who should I tell him sent me? Now, part of this is, it's, it's a legitimate question because during that time period, uh, the name was a very important thing. Not only that, during that time, within the ancient Egyptian culture, um, the, they, the culture was uh, very, they, let, let me see here. I don't want to get it wrong. And then you guys are like, no, Wikipedia and say it's wrong. Because in the Egyptian culture, polytheism and pantheism reign supreme. So here's what that is. Polytheism is this belief in more than one God. Okay? So the Egyptian culture, they believed in that. So it made sense when, when Moses was like, God, who should I tell them sent me? They're going to ask what God sent you. The Egyptians, they had over 2,000 gods. Isn't that crazy? And, and so not only that, they, they even took it a step further um, with the pantheism, and this is the idea that um, everything is God. So that chair you're sitting on, that's a God. Like, that, it sounds crazy, but that's, that was the belief. And, and so it made sense when Moses said, God, but what is your name? Like, part of it was for those people, but, like, they had to know what, what God sent me. Sent you, excuse me. And if that wasn't... a uh, 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 reason enough to give the name. Uh, again, names back in that time, they were very um, intentional, if you will. 
Like they meant something. See, I feel like right now, like the, the time that we live in, names, it's, we, we're just like, I want the trendiest name for my kid. I'm going to call him Blue. Hey. <laughs> I'm going to call him what, whatever, right? Like we, most of us, we just, we just name our kids whatever we think is amazing. But back then, names were important. They were significant to, uh, to what God had for this person's life. A great example uh, we see is in uh, Genesis chapter 25. It's, it's a story of, of Jacob and Esau. And it says this, and when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. Hello, somebody. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with the hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. So Esau, it resembled a word in the Hebrew that meant uh, hair, for hair. So they're like, man, he's hairy, let's name him Esau. (laughs) I'm part Hispanic. We hairy. (laughs) You know how there's a lot of Jesuses? A lot of Esau's. (laughs) (laughs) <clears throat> What's your name? Esau. Esau, Rolando. Excellent. Um, stay on point, John. Stay on point. Jacob, it resembled a, a name in Hebrew, uh, the word for, for heel. And it was based off commentary that I was reading uh, that to grab someone's heel was, was like a phrase that they used back then, which meant like deceiver. Later, if you, if you know the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob was a deceiver. So, like, the names, they meant something. And, and, and so, so, in reality, Moses asking, what is your name? Yeah, I think it stemmed with a lot of it from doubt, but, but it also, like, it made sense. It made sense. And and what I love about this is I love God's response. I love God's response in this story. Moses, again, he's talking with God and and he says, God, what, uh, who should I tell them sent me? And I love God's response. Moses is waiting. What, who, who should I tell sent me? And God says, I am who I am. I love that. It reminds me of the parent phrase, because I said so. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Daddy, why do I? Shut up, because I said so. Like, I feel like there's this swagger with God. Just God, who should I tell? I am who I am. I am. I am. Sam, I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. So could you imagine if I was Moses and God gave me that name? I would just be like, what? (laughs) Okay, I'm leaving. (laughs) Right? Like, this this doesn't make any sense, God. And I'm reading this and I'm like, That is like the most bizarre name ever. Until I realize that within the name I am really encompasses the totality of who God is. I am. Now, so the Old Testament, actually throughout the whole Bible, like there's different names for God. There's Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. The list goes on and on and on and on. So really, when Moses said, God, who sent me? He could have said any name. Think about it. Moses, 
God, who should I tell them sent me? What, God, God could have said, tell him Jehovah Rapha sent you. That means the Lord who, hold it. The Lord who heals. There it is. The Lord who heals. God, who, who should I say sent me? Jehovah Rapha. Well, the only problem with that is that that name, right, because the name means something in that culture. The only problem is when Moses is like, hey, the God who heals me sent me. Well, cool, I guess, Moses, but I'm not really sick. Are you with me? See, when Moses said, God, who, who should, or excuse me, who should I say sent me? He could have said Jehovah Jireh, which means my, the Lord is my provider. Um, that's great, but I don't, don't need much right, right now. God could have said, um, when, when Moses said, God, who should I say sent me? Moses, or excuse me, God could have said, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. But that would only be applicable to people who are looking for peace. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Like, I feel like... God, if he would have given one of those names, it would have limited what people perceived him to do. And so because he wanted people to see the totality and the fullness and the greatness of who he is, rather than going with one little name, he said, I am. He wanted everyone to know that I am. Everything that you need, I am. I am before time started, I am. When time ends, I am. I am your comforter, I am your healer, I am your provider, I am your hope, I am your peace, I am. Everything is encompassed within that name, I am. God, who should I tell them sent me? I am. They'll get that, they'll understand that. They'll understand I am. I am. Within that name, there was no lack. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but if I was going to have someone rescue me, I would want to make sure, or excuse me, I would only put my trust in someone that I knew wasn't lacking. Right? Right? You wouldn't send Superman to save you when you're hidden in a kryptonite building. I would want to know that the person that is rescuing me, that he is up to the task to saving me, delivering me from everything that could possibly happen. And what I love about this, this story with Moses and God and, and God's response of I am is that God, the God I am, he didn't die with Moses and the Hebrew children. But because of Jesus, come on, y'all are quiet this morning. I'm about to quit. I'm about to drop the mic and just quit. But because of Jesus, the very I am was still with us today. Think about that. That's amazing. The very I am that brought people out of Egypt, that eventually brought them into the promised land, that I am is still present today. That's good news. Because that means no matter what you're dealing with, I am. So whatever you're going through that's just kicking your butt and you're like, I just want to quit. I am. I am. 
And so what I want us to do in, in the brief couple moments that we have left, I want to give you the seven I am statements of Jesus. And, and, and we'll see how, how God, I am, is present in the second half of your book, the Bible, I am. So here it is, seven statements, seven I am statements of Jesus. First one, John 6, verse 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Here's number one, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Listen, Jesus is your provider. And I'm not just referring to your physical lacks, but he's your provider in so much more ways than that. He is your provider. He is the one that will nourish and strengthen your soul. See, some of us here this morning, our souls are very drained and tired and filthy. And it feels like we got holes in it. Jesus is your provider to bring nourishment to your soul. He is the bread of life. He's your sustenance. He, he wants to be your nutrition, if that makes sense. Jesus is your provider. Number two, John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have, am I right? Yeah. You will have, if you follow me, my words are like that big, forgive me. Uh, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Number two, I am the light of the world. Jesus is your guide. Jesus is your God. I've shared this before with you guys. Um, driving in foreign places with my wife, it's like one of the most intense things that ever happens in our marriage. Like after we get home from vacation, we literally set up counseling because it's, just, it's like bad. I'm kidding, we don't. But it gets very intense. And, and so we were, uh, I forgot what city we were in. We were trying to find our way. And someone had told me about the Waze app. You guys remember Waze? Maybe not. You can look it up afterwards. Waze. And it's like, it's supposed to be the fastest way to get where you want to go. There's like live update, live feeds. It's, it's amazing. And so, so we, we downloaded this Waze app. We, we put in our, our destination, where we wanted to go, and we just kind of went. We pressed go because you got to press go. And then we just, we just went. And we're driving on, on the freeway for a while. And, and, like, I don't remember who it was, but one of us, we leaned over, like, I feel like we've been driving on this, this freeway for, for a long time. Um, and we, she was like, yeah. So we looked at the phone, and we passed our exit, like, a lot of miles back that way. What happened is that we didn't know we had to turn on the, the, the audio, the navigator, and so we're waiting for the navigation to be like, turn left now, exit, right? And we were waiting, and it never happened. And we are like, oh, my gosh. So we finally clicked it on. We turned it on, and then uh, the, the phone was like, rerouting. And so we finally got our, eventually we got to our destination. Thank you, Jesus. But here's what I, what, what I want you to get out of that illustration. Just because the phone was in our car doesn't mean it was leading us. We'll let that sink in just for a second. <clears throat> just because the phone was in our car does not mean it was leading us. It wasn't until we turned on the audio that we were able to hear where it was leading us. Jesus is your light. He's your guide. But it only works 
when you say, God, take me, take over. I surrender my all. You can have him in your pocket, but it does no good to leading you until you fully surrender. Are you with me? He is your light. And I love what Jesus says where he says, I am the light. If you follow me, you won't walk in darkness because you have the light to lead you. Listen, he wants to lead you. He wants to be your guide. I feel like some of us, like we, we have our phone and we're trying to get directions, but we're like, we're telling the phone where we want to go. Like we would never do that, right? But yet that's what we do sometimes with God. God's like, turn left. We're like, no, no, listen here. We're going right. <laughs> Come on, he wants to lead you. He wants to be your, your light. He wants to be your guide. Number three, John 10, 7. So we explain to them, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. I love this. Uh, I am the door of the sheep. Number three, I'm the door of your sheep. Jesus is your access point. Jesus is your access point. Your ability, your and my ability to have this relationship, not religion, but relationship with God the Father is through Jesus. He is your doorway. He is the door for the sheep of the sheep. He's our access point to God. He's our access point to everything that God has for your and my life. I am the door of the sheep. Number four, John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Number four is this, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Listen, I want you to know this morning, Jesus is your protector. Jesus is your protector. One of the, one of the famous um, shepherds in the Bible, David, um, he, uh, in, in the book of 1 Samuel, in your Old Testament, David, he tells the king Saul um, about times where his little sheep were about to get mauled by bears and lions. And how he had to wrestle lions and wrestle bear, bears in order to protect his sheep. That he was willing to lay down his life for his sheep. I love the parallel of that in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the shepherd that was willing to lay down his life for you and for me. That's amazing. Jesus is your shepherd. Jesus is your shepherd. John 12, John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Here's number five. I am the resurrection and life. I am the resurrection and life. In life, Jesus brings life. Jesus brings life not just to eternity, but Jesus brings life now. While here on earth, this side of eternity, Jesus brings life. You got to know that. See, Jesus is saying in, in, in John chapter 11. He's responding to a sis, two, two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they come to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, my brother, our brother just died. Uh, can you help us? And Jesus said, don't worry, he'll rise again. And uh, Martha thought that Jesus was talking about eternity. But he was talking about that and so much more. Because in John eleven thirty five, 35, it says Jesus wept. The, the, the sisters, they were crying because he died. And Jesus, he, he began to have compassion on them. 
he, he began to have compassion uh, on the lives of, of, of these sisters. And so he goes over to the tomb, and I love this. Just picture this. He goes over to the tomb where, where the sister's brothers are lying, where, where the sister's brother is lying. He tells him to move the stone. He stands at the foot of the, of the tomb. And he says this. Lazarus, come out. Imagine if you were there watching this. This is like you going to a morgue. And you're standing, Jesus is standing in front of those little sliding door things. And Jesus is like, hey, come out. And all of a sudden, he's like, <laughs> ah! like I'm, I'm done right there, right? He's standing at the edge of death. And he says, come out. This morning, I want you to know, don't, let me rephrase that. What I, what I want you to know this morning is this, that with Jesus on your side, nothing is dead until he says so. This morning, I, I just, I feel like, like there's some things that, man, you just, you kind of have tucked away in your tomb, and you're just like, man, I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sad. But Jesus, I feel like this morning, Jesus, he wants you to take him to, to that place where you had buried things, where you thought things were dead. And he wants to do some miracles in your life. He wants to begin to call out those things that you thought were dead. Well, I'll never be healed. Come out! My marriage will never come out. I'll never get rid of this addiction. Come out. Nothing is dead. Nothing is over. Until Jesus says so. Come on. He is your resurrection in life. He is your resurrection in life. Number six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. This is very similar to number three. Of Jesus is your access point. Jesus is the way that leads to God. He is the truth that leads to God, and he is the life that leads to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And number seven, and we're going to end here. John 15, 5. Yes, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Listen, Jesus is your everything. Jesus is your everything. I love the picture in which Jesus is, is painting here. He's like, don't get it twisted. I am your anchor. I am your foundation. I am your tree trunk. Everything comes from me. He is your foundation. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've tried to reverse that. No, God, you got, sorry, I hate to tell you what to do, but I'm the vine. You are the branch. And guess what never works out? That. I love that. I am the vine. You are the branches. This is not the John Peter show. 
This is not the insert your name here show. Jesus is your everything. Jesus wants to be your everything. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, we know that there's a lot of people who are not part of what Jesus has, and they're succeeding and successful. But Jesus, he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, whatever the, call, the, the, the spiritual calling that God has for your life, apart from me, you cannot accomplish that. Everything that the Holy Spirit enables us to do, apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. Jesus is your everything. Come on, somebody. Jesus is your everything.